Visa card was not much of a challenge. Um, learning a new boat is sometimes pretty easy for a long-time professional boat, but sometimes it's pretty challenging. This one was actually more challenging than I thought it was going to be. And uh, the logistics are easy enough, but getting permits now is a real big trick to doing an expedition. I did a couple of them, uh, like with Azra, who I work for here in town. I did Grand Canyon and another company up in Utah, and then did a, a private trip with a bunch of my friends in Cataract Canyon to get this boat on the water. So to do this, we had to start out figuring out how to build it. Uh, we went up and looked at the Edith and took a bunch of measurements. Here I am down underneath it telling Dan where the seams are. I said, write that down, write that down. And came over to Klein Library right here <coughs> upstairs where the coal collection is. Karen mentioned the incredible archive of photos, uh, but what they also have is all of Emory's correspondence. And it is a vast trove of meticulous detail of things he did during his life. Uh, here's the, the receipt of the order for those boats, and it describes all the dimensions, what type of wood, what type of fasteners, how often the fasteners go in. So it's a, a very good thing to use when you're trying to recreate a boat. And some really nice correspondence with the Racine Boat Company. And then I had to get the wood. Uh, it called for northern white cedar out of Vermont. That's pretty hard to find. <coughs> Uh, most of the northern white cedar trees are gone. They're just bushes now with a lot of knots. So we had some fairly knotty wood to work with. This is all stacked up in my shop. See all the stringing bark hanging off it. <clears throat> all the rib work was made at North, or, uh, White Oak from upstate New York. And I've got this all racked up here, just keeping it warm and dry, getting ready to go. And so we started out by cutting out every place where the, uh, the naval architect had described the cross section of the boat, you make a piece of plywood that shape. And then you make a piece of plywood the shape of the bottom curve, and you stick them all on there. And then you can put your bow post on the front, and your transom on the back. So this was the first piece, the bow post, which is two weird bevels. And the pieces I cut off made such great antlers that we made it into a, some kind of a monster. <laughs> And then built the transom, and that goes on back. And then we started steaming up the ribs. And this takes a couple hours where you heat that wood up to a very high temperature in there. And then when you're good and ready, you run out, open that thing up, scoot back in, clamp it in place before it hardens up again. And we did that with all of the, uh, the chines, which is where the side meets the bottom, and all the ribs we had to steam them. And here's my good buddy, Dan Durker, who, <coughs> without him, I don't think we quite would have got there. Uh, Dan's a contractor and carpenter, and he's got a lot of tools that I don't have. And between us, we put this thing together. And there it is. Now, we basically described the boat at this point. We have the bow post, the transom out back, and then these two chine boards, these steam bent oak chine boards and some whiskey from cork and bottle. And at this point, we put in our floor ribs as well. So now we're ready to start planking the boat, which we did. So here's some uh, old senile boatmen that stopped by, Stu Reeder and Tim Cooper. We put them to work planking the floor. This is all that white cedar put nice and tight together, and then we chink it and uh, caulk it. The boards have a bend in the middle, and so what they did on the original, when we copied that, is cut the board and put it back together with a bit of kink in it, and then you nail it with what's called uh, clinch nailing. This, this is the head end of the nail, and this is the pointy end coming through from the other side. You bend it over on itself and pound it back in like a staple. And so that holds this bevel joint together. It's called a scarf joint. It's really cool. Yeah, it's all copper. And so here you can see a, a seam here, and should be one on this side. It's probably back in there somewhere. And then we rivet it to the one below. First you bevel off the top of this board, and then you rivet it in. 
and begins to take shape. Every day it's pretty exciting. Makes a good pizza table too. And uh, these are some folks who came up from Phoenix to help. There's Ed George, he and uh, Peter Blystone are working on a documentary about this boat. Oops! I got to the third strake and realized I forgot to put the bend in it. So instead of going on parallel, it looked like this. So that was a cause for great swearing. Took it off and I cut a new one. And, and then you can see the curve in it that you have to have to actually, it looks straight from the boat, but it's a curved board. And there's the uh, scarf coming right there. And then this is me inside the boat swearing and backing up the rivets while someone else outside is boom, boom, out of the rivets on. And then we oiled her up and she looks really pretty. This Jess Pope came up to take some pictures and help oil it. We ended up taking more pictures of the bottle of whiskey on it than we took of the boat though. There went the evening. <laughs> Have a drink here. So once we got the hull built, we turned it over. And this strong back, all the forms that we built it around, we take that out and it looks like that. It's really cool. And start putting in the ribs. And these are all steam bent as well and then screwed in with brass screws at each joint. And one thing that, that uh, we noticed as we built it, and it was this way on the original, is that these ribs just sort of butt up against that floor chine board, and they're not really fastened on there. And we thought to ourselves, you know, if something crashed into the side out here, that whole side would just break off and collapse. We'll get back to that. <laughs> but it sure is pretty. You know, the further you go along, it, it's just these traditional boats are just such a joy to work on. And then we put on the, uh, the gunnels, which are the, the two boards along the top, really give it a lot of strength and do some uh, promotional photos for the client company here. <laughs> and then start doing the decking, and this is a bulkhead, and that's uh, glued in and sealed in there so that it'll hold the water out. And then this back here will be a cargo hatch. And it's one of those in the front, one in the back. And then start building all the arch deck boards that hold the decks up. And that's all that beautiful white oak, except for this one, which Ed brought over. And it's red oak, damn it. That's supposed to have red oak in that boat. And there it is, all decked out. Or getting ready for the decking, all framed for the decking. Cockpit in here for the boatman, and then these two cargo hatches. Let's go back to the Colts for a minute, see how things were going for them. They spent months trying to locate the camera. Finally did get a used one from a guy. And uh, here's, uh, here's the thing right there, hand crank model. Meanwhile, the Racine Boat Company is pressing forward with the construction of the boats according to plans. Look familiar? It's back in, the, back in Racine. There's all your arch deck boards your bulkheads and framing in the, the hatches here. Ellsworth went back to see how it was going. He had gone to New York City to uh, Abercrombie and Fitch to buy all the expedition materials. There was no REI then. And you had to go to New York City to get camping gear. It's wild. And there's Ellsworth standing there posing in his beautiful boater hat for the uh, camera. We couldn't stand it. We had to do it. <laughs> That's out in front of my shop there. Well, okay, back to the boat. So they shipped him up to Green River, Wyoming on the train in September. They hired a guy to come out of San Francisco, did elaborate negotiations with this guy, a contract, and then at the last minute he said, I can't come. Send him my buddy Jimmy. So Jimmy shows up on the train, Jimmy Fagan, there he is. And off they go to Wyoming and load him up with a tremendous amount of gear and head down the river. They were taking a lot of still images, a lot of stereo images. You know, this is the view master of the day. And those were a, a pretty popular item back then. And this, these are the fire hole chimneys just south of Green River, Wyoming. That's all in the Flaming Gorge Reservoir now and the movies. Ellsworth says, while there were no rapids, use was made of what swift water we found 
by practicing on the method we would use in making a passage through the bad rapids. As to this method, unused as yet by either of us, we had received careful verbal instruction from Mr. Stone, who had made the trip two years before our venture. So this is the extent of their whitewater experience. <laughs> Zero. And this is uh, Ellsworth learning to row at Ashley Falls. Oh! <laughs> ah! Here's Emory coming in. Ellsworth's got to even on the data match here. Oh! <laughs> uh, it's a steep learning curve. They got down below Ashley Falls, there's those rocks, and Emory felt good enough about it, he christened the boat, named it for his lovely daughter, Edith, who was, I think, four or so at the time. And a little later, Ellsworth said, well, nobody loves me, I'll call mine the Defiance. Which he did. And they took lots and lots of pictures. This is Emory, it looks like he's about to fall out of his seat here, or have his arm pulled out of his socket. But it's a steep learning curve to run a boat, and this is a tough boat to row. More stereo shots, this is in the Canyon of Lador, up on the Wyoming, Utah, Colorado border. A uh, very steep set of rocks, rocky rapids. Had really wet, rainy weather and low water. It's a really tough thing they were up against. Here's Ellsworth. He's crashed and sinking the boat again. You can see that's pretty much underwater there. He's throwing everything wildly out onto the bank. Emery's getting a shot. Every time something terrible had happened, the other one would stop and take pictures. <laughs> that's a great one of Ellsworth stranded in the middle of the river like this, and Emery's got. Still shot of it, it's got a stereo shot. <laughs> Ellsworth's out there, my boat's floating down river, Emory. But they had to get there. This is at the steepest drop in the door called Hell's Half Mile. And here's a spot, no one had ever run this rapid. And uh, so they portage all their heavy gear around it and then uh, work the boats through the rocks over the rocks. This one's uh, Jimmy Fagan shooting this. There's Ellsworth and Emery. And they're uh, just rocking it over the rocks. And these are tough old boats, you know, to put up with that kind of abuse. On they go. September 10th, Jimmy entertained us with songs. September 11th, James entertained with songs. September 28th, Hidden songs for the past week have ceased to the Biscayne Cross. He talks at home in Moscow. <laughs> September 29th. Jimmy cries in <laughs> October 1st. Jim cries for the week. October 2nd. Ed warned Jim if he cried again, he would beat him. So he saw the lake of God in and work. October 3rd, they send Jimmy home. <laughs> and carry on alone without him, which was a lot more work for them to try and get photos and run boats and all that. <clears throat> this is the uh, Green River Dam right above the Green River back when it's made out of stumps. And it's now made out of concrete. Still kind of an annoying obstacle for boating. Down in Cataract Canyon, they ran into another boat and found a character on the shore, One-Eyed Charles Smith. And old One-Eyed Charles said, well, I bought that boat from Nathaniel Galloway. And so this is one of the uh, original style of Galloways that wasn't built back east. And uh, get slightly flared sides, flat on the bottom, a little upcurved, kind of rotten. They wrote in their book that they did not figure Smith would survive the trip. He actually did. He wrote them a letter after that, said thanks for the help. He went and made another trip, and then went back and made yet another, but they never found him. They just found his wrecked boat. Probably drowned. Poor fella. <coughs> On we go, crashing through the big rapids. Here's a uh, <coughs> mile-long rapid in cataract. He's actually getting the technique down here. He's doing a nice sideways pull. We go tuck it in behind one. So they were learning. Albeit slowly. This is big drop three, dropping through there. Lee's Ferry, November 7th. Emory had been writing to his wife Blanche at South Rim at every place where he could get mail out, like Height and Jensen. But for the last few stops, he got nothing back, and he was kind of peeved. 